It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips Evnia 34M2C7600MV. A lot of this would apply to other Evnia models as well. The OSD is controlled by a little joystick, which is at the rear, towards the right side, if you view the monitor from in front. If you hold the joystick for a few seconds, then it will turn the monitor off and you just press it to turn it on again. If you move the joystick left when you're not in the main menu system, you can access the smart image game presets and I'll go through them when I get to them in the main menu system. If you move the joystick up when you're not in the main menu system, it allows you to quickly select the input used by the monitor. If you press the joystick down or to the right, then you get straight into the main menu system. So some of you will have realized that there aren't any shortcut keys on this monitor which is a little bit annoying, so there aren't any customizable shortcuts. Navigating through the main menu system takes a little bit of getting used to as well. So to actually close the menu, if you want to get out of the menu, you have to select close, which is at the end. Now, if I'm here at this side and I press left again, it will close the menu instantly. If I'm, let's say, over here, so perhaps I want to press right a few times to close the menu, then it doesn't do it instantly. Then you have to press right again or up or down. Just a little bit of a quirk, just something to get used to. And if I want to get deeper into the menu, so let's say I want to go into game mode, I then press down, and you can see it's highlighted Adaptive Sync now. And I can select my option there, then I can press right to go deeper into the menu. If I want to now exit the menu, I could technically just hold the left button until it eventually closes. Just a general comment as well, it takes a while for the menu to come up. So I'm just going to press the joystick right now. And then it finally comes up. It's a bit laggy. When you're in the menu system itself, it's not too bad. I wouldn't say it's super snappy, but it's not super laggy either. Anyway, let's go through the options. So you've got smart image first. These are the presets. Standard is, as you'd imagine, the standard preset, sort of the factory defaults, if you like. FPS. Now, what most of these presets will do is they'll just change things that you can adjust manually. They won't necessarily lock things or they won't appear to lock things. So I can adjust the brightness, the contrast, the gamma, but it sets some of these two different preset values and it might change a few things in game mode as well, which is the next section of the menu. So for some reason, FPS seems to set smart response to off, which is really not the setting you should be using, especially not for FPS games. So it's a bit odd. If you like to use these, then feel free, but you can make your own adjustments and just use these presets, customize them yourself. That's absolutely fine. RTS by default has this strange little box at the top left, so if you see this weird little box on your monitor, this is called Smart Frame. You can also activate this in various other presets, I believe standard mode you can do it as well. So this is found in game mode as Smart Frame, and actually it's greyed out with the standard setting. I do apologise, you can't use it with the standard setting, but game 1 and game 2, these are fully customizable and have all of your options you can configure smart frame. So that just lets you select a portion of the screen. You can make the box bigger. You could actually have it filling the entire screen if you want. And this allows you to adjust the digital brightness. So it doesn't adjust the backlight brightness, the digital brightness and the contrast for a separate section of the screen. If you're one of those people who just likes to super tweak the image for whatever reason, then you could set it full screen and do that. You can change the horizontal and vertical position you can also change the size of the box. So as I said, you can have it filling the entire screen if you like. So game one and game two are really the main ones I'd focus on. You can customize them to your liking and it doesn't lock things off. The only exception, there is an sRGB setting. That's an sRGB emulation mode, a gamut clamp, which will lock the gamut close to sRGB. This only works in the standard setting. It will appear that it is available in other settings, but it doesn't actually apply the clamp, so it doesn't work correctly. So they should really gray it out so it doesn't look like it's available. If you're using the sRGB setting, you can adjust the brightness according to your preferences. If you adjust things like contrast, gamma, or color temperature, then it will actually turn sRGB off. You can see it's now set to off because I've changed the color temperature. So again, they should really have grayed this out so it's clear what you can and can't change, but be aware that you can adjust the brightness. You can also adjust 
the response time setting and various things in game mode if you need to as well. So the, the movie setting is again just another alternative. It sets the gamma to 2.4 by default so it gives a bit of a punchy contrasty look if you like. Low blue mode, this is a low blue light setting. And this is effective, it's explored in the written review. It gives a much warmer look to the image. Bit of a green tint, but not too strong. It gives a more relaxing viewing experience that some people will like. An alternative would be to, let's say you were using standard or game one, game two, whatever it might be. An alternative, which I have actually my game two set to, is to set the color temperature to 5000K. This is also a very effective low blue light setting, but it doesn't have that green tint. It has more of a sort of amber tint, which I find my eyes are just too more readily than a green tint or green or yellow tint. So I prefer this setting personally for my low blue light requirements. And the other settings of interest is economy. This will just set to a relatively low brightness or reasonably low brightness by default. But again, it's just a preset. You can customize it to your liking. Smart uniformity is a little bit different. That applies the digital uniformity compensation algorithm, which will make some adjustments at various points of the screen to even out, for example, color temperature and supposedly brightness. On my unit, it didn't really help with brightness uniformity. That was actually fine without this setting enabled, but it did make some improvements to color temperature uniformity. So if you're interested in this setting, refer to the written review. It does come at the expense of contrast as usual for such a setting. So to go through some of the other options, brightness, the usual control there, contrast, Smart contrast, this is a dynamic contrast setting which is explored in the written review. I would recommend keeping this disabled. Various gamma settings, 1.8, 2.0, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6. .2 These won't necessarily correspond to the exact values given here. On my unit, they were actually pretty close. My unit was quite good in terms of its calibrations, so the labels here were pretty appropriate. Sharpness, which you can set between zero, which is very unsharp, and 100. 50 is the default, it's the one I like to use, that's what I would recommend, but if you like to tweak things a little bit, feel free. sRGB, which I've been through, and as I said, it only works properly in the standard mode. It looks like I can enable it here, but it doesn't actually clamp the gamut, it doesn't do what it should be doing. So you have to be using the standard mode if you want to use sRGB. Color temperature, sort of went through that, but you can see various different options here, 5000K, 6500. The interesting thing about this monitor is that you can't adjust the red, green, and blue color channels manually, which is a really odd restriction. This is the first monitor I've actually reviewed where it isn't possible, or at least the first one I've reviewed for many years that doesn't have this option. I have made Philips aware of this, that I think it's an odd restriction and actually quite an annoying restriction. Now, fortunately, my unit was not very nicely calibrated if I just use this native setting, which is sort of supposed to be the factory default setting. On my unit, preset and native seem to be exactly the same. I mean, I didn't, I suppose I didn't check all of the presets, but I did check a few and it seemed to be exactly the same as native. So it is odd not to be able to adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. Really odd restriction. Potentially something they could add in future firmware. And then there's reset, which is an option to reset the smart image settings to the factory default, or perhaps this particular preset to the factory default. And you can also see there's the indication of the current resolution and refresh rate, a few things at the bottom there. The refresh rate is an interesting one because that will change in real time to reflect the frame rate if you're using VRR, variable refresh rate. So I've got NVIDIA's Pendulum demo open at the moment. The frame rate is going all over the place and so is the refresh rate. You might sometimes see it sort of jump up. That's because it's actually under the LFC boundary, low frame rate compensation, so it's doubling the frame rate with its refresh rate at times. Just gives you an indication that VRR is active and doing its thing. Next, you've got game mode, adaptive sync, that allows you to use AMD FreeSync or NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode. You can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode via HDMI 2.1 VRR or use HDMI 2.1 VRR more broadly, for example, on the PS5, without having adaptive sync active. But if you do happen to have it active, you can also use HDMI 2.1 VRR. So it doesn't really matter. I would just leave this enabled if you have any interest in VRR generally and just don't worry about it. There's no sort of drawback really to having it enabled. What I would say though is that it might seem to be problematic because it grays out low input lag. You'll see that's grayed out. If I have adaptive sync disabled, then I can activate this low input lag feature. 
but actually in my testing, if you're using Adaptive Sync, it basically just uses low input lag anyway. It's as if it's enabled. There's Crosshair, it's quite an interesting Crosshair implementation actually. So I've got that set to on. You'll see a white Crosshair in the middle of the screen. Just change the wallpaper so it contrasts a little bit more. And speaking of contrasting a little bit more, it also had a setting called Smart Crosshair. And this will adjust the color of the crosshair if you select Smart Crosshair on according to the color of the background. So it's white here, it contrasts nicely. If I change my background, well, it's also white there, but you see now it's gone black. And it's not just black or white, it's now gone cyan to contrast with this orange background. So it just tries to keep itself visible depending on the sort of shades surrounding it. So it's quite a neat little feature actually. It's an interesting implementation. I haven't seen that kind of thing before myself. You can't adjust the crosshair design though and you can't change the position of the crosshair on the screen. Just on or off or smart crosshair. Next you've got dark boost. So I've got Legom, legom.nl, the website, the black levels test open there just to give you an idea of what this does. This is a gamma enhancement which will selectively lighten up darker shades without affecting your brighter shades so much, although it does also appear to oversaturate things, so it actually has a wider reaching effect than you might expect. Particularly at level three, I can see some clear oversaturation, and if I go on the contrast blocks, I can see, you won't necessarily be able to see this on the video, I'm sorry about that, but to my eye, I can see that a lot of the more saturated shades are heavily blended together. There's a huge loss of shade variety. Yeah, and even at level one, there's a bit of that going on. But the idea here is really to give you a competitive edge. That oversaturation could be considered an advantage, making enemies easier to spot in your game, perhaps that kind of thing. But it's really the uplift of the darker shades, which is really a key competitive advantage with this setting. So that improves the visibility of these three being the strongest setting. It doesn't adjust your black point or doesn't significantly affect your black point. So it doesn't really affect your contrast. So it's quite an interesting implementation. I think quite a good implementation considering this setting is meant to give you a competitive edge. I'd certainly say it would do that. But if you like things to look more as intended, I would keep this disabled. You've got smart response. You can set this to off fast, faster or fastest. I'm not sure why it's on fastest right now because I was playing around with something before. It should be on faster. That's my preferred setting. This is all explored in the review, the smart frame, which I've been through. And next there's the fun stuff, ambiglow. So often on monitors, I find the RGB lighting quite gimmicky because if it has it at the rear, sometimes you won't be able to see it unless you're actually behind the monitor or it'll just give a very gentle glow around the monitor. However, this setting is truly useful as it can be used as a bias light because it gives a strong pool of light behind the monitor to really sort of demonstrate this in the best way possible. I would recommend light mode set to static. And if you then go to ambiglow setting, you can change the color. There are various different options here. So it's just set to white at the moment and that gives you a really nice pool of cool light. And I actually do talk about this in the video review as well. I sort of talk about this with respect to contrast and how it can be used as a bias light to improve perceived contrast if you're in a dark or more dimly lit room. So you can see that pool of light, it really extends quite far up my wall. I know my wall is white as well, so it might not be super clear, but it really does give a nice pool of light. There are also strips at the bottom of the monitor. And if you like, you can have it so it's just using the bottom strip. You can have it so it's using the central strip and you can have it so it's using all of the LEDs. So where it says light position, all zones, four-sided, central or bottom, depending on your preference. So at the rear of the monitor, I'll show you the lights there. They go along the top, they go down the sides, and also in the middle, a strip. Plenty of LEDs there, good powerful LEDs. So I'll just show you some of the other colors. I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail, show you everything, but the rainbow one is pretty cool. I sometimes set it to that just because I kind of like it. It's, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of cheerful. Red. Looks kind of evil. Rose. Magenta. Violet. Blue. 
Azure. Some of these might be called slightly different things depending on your region, by the way, and not just if you, even if you do speak English as your native language, they, they might call, call these shades slightly different things because I could see that some of them had a bit of a different name in the manual. Cyan, Aqua, which I believe is called Aquamarine in some regions, Green, fun, isn't it? Pear, which is a yellowish green. I believe this is called Chartreuse in some regions as well. Or maybe they just renamed it, I'm not sure. Yellow, and orange. Orange is useful. I know it's called orange, but it's really a very yellowish orange. And it sort of takes the place of the warm white setting because the white setting is a cool white. There isn't really a warm white setting. So if I use this in the evening, I tend to prefer to use the orange setting. It's more restful on the eyes. And then back to rainbow again. You can also set the brightness, brightest, brighter, which is actually significantly dimmer, or bright, which is not bright at all. Still visible if the room's dark enough. So back to light mode, there are various other options. Follow video, that's an interesting one because that will allow the lights to react to the content on the screen. And it doesn't just do it as one single zone, it actually has several zones, so it has quite reasonable precision. And I know some people like this when they're gaming or watching movies, it's sort of almost as if the image extends beyond the screen and some people might find that more immersive. I'm not really fussed about it myself, I'm not really too into this kind of thing myself, but I can see the appeal, I do understand it, and it does work well. So I'm just gonna fire up a game to give you an idea of what this does. So I'm just loading up some Battlefield 5, I might as well show you the lights whilst it's loading. So you can see the screen is mainly black, so it's not really doing much of the lighting, it's pretty much off. What's well, actually on but dim, sort of dim white. Then it springs to life, and as I change the position, you can see various different shades appearing. So there are nice autumnal colours here, and that's reflected in the back there as well. More so if I zoom in and it's filling up more of the screen. But you'll see it blends the colours in, so there's the sky as well, and a variety of green shades, as well as these oranges and browns. So, it might not be clear in the video, but the lighting is actually has a bit of a pink hue there sort of a mixture of the colours, whereas here where it's showing more sky, it's really more of a cool tint. To make this clearer, I've got the GOMS test for viewing angles opened up with four different windows showing four different colours, so quad Legom if you like, and you'll see that, or hopefully see that the lights there are pink, and then it transitions to blue, and it might not be clear in the video, I'm really sorry about that, it's just because of how the camera captures it and then it transitions to purple, and then to green. And at the rear, it reflects the pink, blue, purple, and green as well. So it does work well, and it's fairly reactive to changes as well. You see, it's not instant, so it's not super annoying. It doesn't look like super annoying, hyper-reactive flickering like this sort of setting can sometimes look like. So they've sort of blended it in a little bit, which is quite good, I think. It's quite good implementation. What's a less good implementation, or at least to me it doesn't seem to work at all, is follow audio. I'm not gonna demonstrate this because I've tested it quite extensively and I just couldn't get it to work. Yes, you do have to have the audio fed through the monitor, but I tested it feeding to the monitor speakers, follow audio, and it just seemed to occasionally flicker a little bit. But to be completely honest, I couldn't say it was following the audio at all, so a bit of an odd setting. And the remaining settings here, they're basically just different animation patterns. So there's color shift, which does this funky little thing. Color wave. And you can customize the color as well, so I don't necessarily have to have this, you don't necessarily have to have this white color. So you could even have it set to rainbow, doing these animations if you prefer. So that's the rainbow wave. There's breathing. So there's pulses. Starry night. Which kind of twinkles, I guess. 
Again, I'm not really too fussed about these animation patterns myself. I prefer static. And I should also mention when I was showing you the follow video before, the brightness was reasonable, but it never seemed to get as bright as the static mode. But I'm sure that's because it's blending the colors quite in quite complex ways. It, maybe it depends on what you're showing on the screen. But I did try with a full white screen and I wouldn't say it was as bright as my normal static white. And I also checked that the brightness was set to maximum. It's still bright enough so you can notice it. Maybe they did this on purpose because it could get super distracting if it was very bright. You can reset the ambi glow to the factory defaults and you can turn it off. Another thing is that there's an upcoming software which I believe is going to be called Evnia P Center and this will allow you to customize the ambi glow apparently in, in more ways. That's not available at the time of this video so I can't show you that but just think it's worth being aware of for the future. Oh, it seems so dark now. You know, I'm going to turn the ambiglow lighting back on. Kind of miss it already. Next up, there's input, which allows you to select the input of the monitor. Surprise, surprise. Or you can select auto if you'd like the monitor to decide which input it's using for you. You've then got audio, so you can change the volume of the integrated speakers. Or I'd assume anything connected to the 3.5mm jack if you're using that. Various different audio modes, these are for the speakers. I explored these in the written review if you're interested, but they just change the equaliser and give you a little bit of different quality to the sound. Just as a general point, I'd say the integrated speakers on this monitor are quite good. They're not the best I've heard, but they're I'd say they're, they're comfortably above average. They're definitely usable and you know, quite reasonable to use if you have to. You can mute them, change the audio source if you've got multiple things connected to the monitor, multiple inputs. I'm just using one system at the moment. And EQ. So if you have audio mode set to off, you can access the EQ, the equalizer, and you can customize that. Next up, you've got system. You can select HDMI refresh rate. So I think it defaults to 144 hertz, sorry, 120 hertz. It's just really a compatibility thing but you can select 165 hertz if you are using a PC and you want to get the maximum refresh rate. OSD setting, you can change the horizontal and vertical position of the OSD, change the transparency level. So if you like the OSD to be practically invisible, then you can do that. OSD timeout, so how long after the last button press or movement of the joystick really, before the OSD will automatically disappear or you can manually get rid of it by selecting close as I showed you before. PIP, P by P, picture in picture, picture by picture. So if you select picture in picture, your main source will fill up most of the screen and then you've got a little box which will show your secondary source. So this is two way P by P, two system P by P on this monitor. So you can change the input used for your sub source, which is that little box there. Change the size so you can have a middle box or you can have a large box or you can have that small box that I showed you before. So the large box fills up a quarter of the screen. You can also have it so it's top right, top left, bottom right or bottom left. And you can swap it over so your primary and secondary sources are inverted. And there's PBP, picture by picture. which gives you a nice side-by-side. -side. You can see it's changed the resolution. It says change resolution to 1720 by 1440 for full screen. And that's actually what it's automatically set it to for me. So it's filling up the entirety of half of the screen. And you'll see that the resolutions you can select have changed. So you can't select the native 3840 by 1440. It's halved, so it's half of the screen horizontally, but all of the pixels vertically. And yes, you can select 165 hertz. You don't have to have it set to 60 hertz. Next up, you've got smart size, and that is grayed out if you are using adaptive sync. Be aware you can use this if you're using HDMI 2.1 VRR and you've got adaptive sync disabled. So you can actually use VRR and the scaling functionality of the monitor. This is explored a bit in the interpolation and upscaling section of the vision review if you're interested. But basically the monitor I'm just going to turn off adaptive sync so I can show you these settings. There are various different settings which will emulate different screen sizes. So I've got the monitor running its native 3440 by 1440 resolution at the moment. You can see that at the bottom left of the OSD. Screen size options. 
I will come back to the 27 inch wide. There is a reason you might want to use this, but be aware that it just sort of squishes it up if you're using the native resolution as I am now. But if you're using certain non-native resolutions, this might actually make sense and I will get to that very shortly. So I'm not gonna go through all of these. You can see the options there. The monitor does not support scaling for 2560 by 1440 QHD 1440p. So if I select that, even if I select it at 120 hertz, or you may expect scaling to be provided, this is just GPU scaling. You'll see that the monitor is also reporting 3440 by 1440, which is an indication for you that it is not using scaling. It's just the GPU scaling taking over here. If you select the full HD resolution, on the other hand, I've got 165 hertz selected. And this again is GPU scaling 3440 by 1440. I'm not just relying on what the OST is telling me. I have tested this more extensively, just in case you're interested. If, however, I select something from this first list for the full HD resolution, so 120 hertz or 60 hertz would work as well, the monitor can now use scaling. You can see it correctly reports 1920 by 1080 for the resolution. And it's filling up the entire screen because I'm using the 34 inch setting. So yes, it looks stretched and weird because this is a 16 by nine resolution and I'm telling it to fill up the entire screen. There's one-to-one, -one, a pixel mapping feature, which will only use the pixels called for in the source resolution. So you'll see that there's a big black border for the remaining pixels, which aren't required, but an undistorted full HD in the middle of the screen. And there's aspect. Now what this is supposed to do is it's supposed to pay attention to the aspect ratio and keep things looking correct whilst filling up as much of the screen as possible. But you should be able to see that things are squashed up. So this isn't doing what it should be doing. However, if you select screen size 27 inches, that's how you will get the sort of experience that you'd expect aspect to give you. So it's now maximizing the screen space without messing up the aspect ratio. So it's 16 by nine, it's using interpolation for this resolution, filling up as much of the screen as possible, black borders for the unused horizontal pixels, if you like. And if you wanted to use the 2560 by 1440 resolution, of course, as I said, that's not gonna be using monitor interpolation, but you can use GPU scaling. As usual, you can have this kind of experience, but no interpolation is required because this sort of amount of the screen being filled up would match 2560 by 1440 pixels naturally anyway. But for this full HD resolution, interpolation is required because there's not that one-to-one -one match. Next, you've got USB setting. You can allow the monitor to prioritize resolution and refresh rate or data transfer speed. So if you select USB 3.2, it'll basically use more of the USB bandwidth for data and less for the display signal. If you want to be using the full display signal capabilities are similar to what you get with DisplayPort, then you have to select USB 2.0. And it says there high resolution. If you select 3.2, it then tells you high data speed. So it makes it quite clear what it's prioritizing. As USB standby mode, on or off. Off is the default setting. That means that you will not be using the USB ports when the monitor is in standby. It's in a low power state. Whereas if you have this set to on, you can use the USB ports even when the monitor is in standby. But the downside of that is that there's gonna be extra power draw. Even if you're not using those ports, it will increase your standby power consumption. That's why the off setting is generally preferred if you don't need that feature. There's KVM. So this allows you to automatically assign your input or you can select the input that's gonna be used for the data side of KVM, USB-C or USB upstream, which is the USB-B port. So the idea with KVM, if you're not familiar, is you'd have one system connected with USB-C, you'd have another system, let's say a PC, connected with a different input, so HDMI or display port, and you'd then connect that same system with USB-B. That means you've basically got two systems connected and the one with USB-C can be fed data, it can be fed the display signal. The one connected with USB-B and your display signal can of course be sent data as well and your display signal. And KVM just lets you quickly switch between those systems so you, you change the display signal. And at the same time, your USB peripherals which are connected to the monitor are reassigned to either the USB-C port or the USB type B port for the data transfer. 
So if you have auto selected on KVM, it should really follow whatever signal the you've selected as the monitor. Remember that you can quickly select the signal or the input by pressing joystick up. So if I had something connected with USB-C and I selected USB-C here and KVM was set to auto, it should reassign my USB peripherals to the USB-C system as well. But if you want to manually select the system that you're assigning the peripherals to, then you could select one of the other options with KVM. Hopefully that all made sense. There's local dimming. And that is grayed out unless you're using HDR. I'm going to switch over to HDR to show you that the system is very different when you're running HDR, the menu system. So you see it says HDR mode. And now my presets are completely different. These are explored in the review. I'd recommend sticking to display HDR 1400. If you like to customize things or you prefer the look of one of the other settings, feel free to experiment with them. Personal gives you this light enhance feature and again this is explored in the review but there are no other settings to customize here you've got your game mode settings yes you can use vrr with hdr you can have your crosshair on you can't use dark boost you can't change the brightness or gamma or anything like that and yeah you can use ambi glow and various other things as well local dimming and this setting is again explored in the review basically changes the amount of dark versus light biasing that goes on. Again, I'm not going to go through that here, but it is explored in the review. My preference is medium, but other people might have their own preferences. And that's why you can change the setting that lets you do that. Or you can disable local dimming if you are a very strange person and you don't want to use basically the feature of this monitor that you've paid a significant amount of money for. Next there's overscan, and even if you've got the monitor using scaling, so I've got it set to full HD, 120 hertz, this is grayed out. Well, I've just tested a large range of resolutions and I couldn't get overscan to show. I'm not sure if you need to have the monitor connected via HDMI for that to work, but I do recall with AOC and Philips monitors in the past, this is usually a setting which requires a very specific resolution and refresh rate to actually work. But what it's supposed to do is let the image flow off the screen and it sort of zooms you in a bit. I know some people like that for competitive reasons. You have to have a very specific resolution and refresh rate for this to work, it seems. Next, you've got setup. You can change the brightness of the power LED, which glows white. It's at the bottom right there. If that annoys you, you can have it disabled or dimmer, a bit brighter. Brighter again, brighter again. I think three was the default. I'm not really too sure why I had three selected. I just didn't really find the power light obtrusive. And I kind of like the design of the power LED on this monitor anyway. So I just left it on set to three. You can change the language of the OSD. Resolution notice. So this gives you a notice on the screen if it's not running the native resolution. Information shows the model and the serial number. Reset. Resets everything to the factory defaults. So just a final thing to go through is smart control software and there's a link to download that in the description of the video. This allows you to control the monitor. You don't have to have the USB cable connected and as I mentioned earlier on there is a new piece of software coming out called Evnia P Center. I believe that's what it's going to be called and this will allow you to have to have basically the same functionality of smart control but it'll look a little bit more modern. It will also allow you to change the ambiglow settings. I'm not sure if there are other things they'll add, other features they'll add. But in setup here, there is something where you will want the USB cable connector. That's if you want to be upgrading the firmware. That's where it says version upgrade. Press check firmware version upgrade. And at the moment it says the monitor does not support firmware upgrades. It is something they're gonna add in the future. Maybe with the Evnia P Center it will come. Or maybe it is actually available, it's just that there aren't any new firmware options available. I have tested this with the USB cable connected, by the way, and it said exactly the same thing. Some other options here. I'm just going to go through this quite quickly. Various information from the EDID of the monitor. You can reset everything to the factory default. Screen rotate option, which just sort of follows the same setting in Windows. Multi-monitor, if you've got more than one monitor connected, you can select which one you're controlling here. Change the language that the OSD is displayed in. Remote control, that's interesting. I haven't fiddled around with this. Seems that you can control the monitor from a different system. Very interesting. Anyway, there's picture at the top as well. Some basic picture options. So the smart scale or smart size, or whatever it is they called it. A few options here.
I've just enabled adaptive sync and as I suspected, you can't adjust these because it doesn't allow you to use scaling when you've got adaptive sync active. And these were different to the options that were available in the OSD, you'll recall. Brightness, you can quickly change the brightness used by the monitor. That works as you'd expect. We'll reset that to the factory default value. Or perhaps, actually it's not the factory default, I think it just resets it to the level you had set in the OSD before. Contrast, same thing. You can turn on that resolution notification thing I discussed just before, or you can select the resolution used by the monitor, resolution and refresh rate. Select the input, some PIP, P by P options, and you'll see these seem to mirror what was shown in the OSD. Color options. Now this is interesting because if you recall, I said you can't change the red, green, and blue color channels through the OSD. However, there is a user defined setting, which is what Philips will call their red, green, and blue color channel control, which wasn't there in the OSD, but you can select this and you can adjust the color channels. And that's for the monitor. It's not doing some weird software thing. This is actually changing it on the monitor. So if you need to change the color channels, you can indeed do so using the smart control software. And there's again the sRGB setting, but as you'll recall, you can only use that in standard mode, otherwise it doesn't apply the clamp properly. You can change the gamma setting. And just to show you that it does quickly reflect your changed settings in the OSD. So you can see the gamma's changed to 1.8 now in the OSD. And yes, it will close the OSD if you make a change in smart control. So it doesn't want you making changes at exactly the same time with the OSD and the software. It's controlling the same thing. You can change the smart image preset. Also application mode presets. So if you want to have different smart image presets for different applications, that's what you can do there. You can change the volume, but there aren't the full audio options here. And there's some eco power options, which really, I think they're just related to the Windows power control. You can set a power off schedule if you want to have the screen switch off at various times as well. So actually these would extend beyond what you could do with the Windows power options. So sorry if I was misleading there. And you can change the power LED brightness. You can download Smart Desktop, which is another application which I'm not going to go through. As it says, it's a window manager utility for arranging and snapping windows. To be honest, Windows 11, I find, has some good options there and it works very well for me for what I need to do. But if you want more flexibility, perhaps consider this. And setup, which I have been through. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Philips Evnia 34M2C7600MV. Be sure to check out the full review on pcmonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Also be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, nice way of showing your support.